I just want to start by stating something that is somehow not understood. The policy of the United States uh, began with something called flatten the curve to reduce the potential of hospital overcrowding. And then it almost immediately turned into stopping COVID-19 cases, period. In early 2020, uh, the leaders of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Birx, advised the nation to have lockdowns. And lockdowns meant school closures, business shutdowns, limits on hospital care, and a host of other restrictions, mandates, and quarantines. And following that advice, almost all governors in the United States implemented and maintained lockdowns throughout the country in almost every single state. The result of the policy that was implemented is more than 600,000 American deaths have been attributed to the virus, to the virus directly. So just to start out by saying, if anyone concludes that the pandemic policy failed or thinks that lives were lost due to the wrong policy, they are necessarily concluding that that advice on lockdowns was grossly wrong and lockdowns failed because the lockdowns were implemented no matter what else anyone, no matter what anyone else said. What happened? Well, there were first of all several claims about the SARS virus that became rapidly ingrained in the public by the time spring rolled around of 2020. Those claims were generally initiated by the World Health Organization Modelers extrapolated from those claims using severe, really false assumptions and ignoring decades of experience with viral pandemics. The claims were repeated as well as the extrapolations by public health officials and people in government, and then they were amplified by the media. Well, what specifically was claimed back in spring of 2020? SARS-2 virus was extremely deadly, far deadlier than the flu by several orders of magnitude. Everyone has a significant risk to die. No one has immunity because the virus is a novel virus. Everyone is dangerous and spreads the infection. Asymptomatic people are major drivers of the spread. Testing everyone is urgently needed. All those tested positive should be isolated and all exposed must be quarantined. Locking down will stop or eliminate the virus. Masks will protect everyone and stop the spread. Immune protection is only from a vaccine and that's years away. Every one of these claims is false and has been proven false. Before we even go into things about COVID, we have to start out by recognizing the data is flawed. The data, what I mean by the data, is timelines and trends of cases, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID, and major problems with PCR testing. And why is this important? This is not a complaint. This is something to put everything uh, very much in your heads about what you're reading because all policy decisions and all assessments of those policies were based upon the statistics from these things, testing, tallies, peaks and trends over time. And if you're gonna make policies or react to trends, they better be accurate. You better know what the trends are. This is an example back in July of 2020 of Florida deaths by day since this is the beginning of the pandemic till, till recently. And we have the peak there labeled. The problem was the real peak is here. Now that looks like a small difference, but this is weeks different. Why is there a difference? Because this is the actual event of the death. Most peaks, most trends, most things that were talked about in the task force by people who should know better, were the dates of recording. That's not the same thing. Now, why is that important, that, that difference that looks so small? This is LA County, January 2021, deaths from COVID. This is the actual date of death curve. The difference is about three weeks. If you're gonna say you better do something because the deaths are peaking, and then you look and say, well, actually the deaths are declining, that's a problem. This is Columbus, Ohio, cases 
during the spring and summer of 2020. That's the peak of the cases per day, July 17th. If you want to do something and you're panicking because the cases are peaking, say, July 13th, 14th, this is the actual date of the cases occurring, not recorded, but occurring. If you're going to start implementing something, the cases are already finished. This is the peak. Other problems, hospitalizations and deaths. This is headline generating news. Florida reports 120 new deaths on July 8th, 2020. But almost all those deaths occurred weeks to months before that. This is the CDC reporting 4,576 deaths on July 8th, 2020. 80% of them occurred months earlier. Okay, these are headline generating news items and reflect, not only generate policy decisions, but reflect reactions to so-called uh, policies that were implemented. This is an epi curve. If you don't know what an epi curve is, you should have no call to be advising the President of the United States on a pandemic. You can guess how many people in the room besides me ever showed a curve like that. Now, what is this curve? This curve shows in the column on the left that you can't read uh, that those are the color-coded dates of recorded deaths. And when you look at that, if, you, if I had this magnified appropriately, you would see that, say, September 19th recording, those are de deaths that, that, or cases, it's the same thing, that uh, spread out for weeks to months beforehand. So, the dates are very important, again, if you're making policy decisions based upon dates. This is like level one of understanding the pandemic. What about defining the term from COVID? Hospitalizations or deaths from COVID. This is Arizona last summer. I got to the White House in August. They were still talking about a grossly inaccurate understanding of how many people were actually hospitalized from COVID. If you look at the blue there, the blue is the people who actually were hospitalized with COVID illness. The red plus the blue are the people that had, categorized, had been categorized as hospitalized for COVID in Arizona. Okay, less than a third of people that were categorized as hospitalized from COVID actually had COVID. They had a positive COVID test because everybody was being tested for COVID. But if you came in with appendicitis and you had a positive test for SARS-2 virus, you were categorized as having COVID as your hospitalization. So that, that's less than a third of people hospitalized. At the peak of hospitalizations in Arizona who were called COVID hospitalizations, they actually had COVID. This is not just a case or an anecdotal report. This is one of several studies that have now been published in the medical journal. This is a study from my colleagues at Stanford who uh, published a, a report from the Packard Children's Hospital retrospectively of people who were hospitalized from COVID. They were COVID hospitalizations in kids. It turns out that almost half of people that were categorized as hospitalizations from COVID were asymptomatic from COVID. They had zero symptoms of COVID, zero. There's no ambiguity, they did not have COVID. They had a positive SARS test. That's not why they were hospitalized, but yet they are tallied as COVID hospitalizations. And that has been replicated in several studies now. The bottom line is the true cause of death or hospitalization must be an illness. It is not a positive virus test, right? You don't die from a positive virus test. You die from an illness. And it turns out that 40 to 50 percent, roughly, of COVID hospitalizations in the United States, the way we do testing, are not COVID. That's not minimizing the 600,000 people that died from COVID. I'm just saying we have to know what we're talking about when we say from COVID. It turns out that many COVID deaths are not COVID. They're called COVID deaths because they had a positive test for SARS-2. How do I know this? There was a study being done by an outside consultant when I was in DC, and they were tracking by chart review, individual chart review, which is very laborious, who had COVID, who was called COVID. 
And using very, very conservative measures, about 20% of people in the Medicare age group did not have COVID. They had zero symptoms of COVID, but they were called COVID deaths. The study was stopped once Joe Biden won for president. There is no study being done on that. PCR testing. PCR tests define if someone is a case of COVID. That's the definition of a case in the United States. And that has implications. People are isolated, quarantined, or certainly categorized for peaks and trends on that basis. A PCR positive test means you are a case. PCR is extraordinarily sensitive. It was never meant to be a diagnostic test, by the way, but it's very sensitive to detect genetic material. PCRs, PCR tests, stay positive on mean for about a month. It is known and widely accepted and not debated that you are not, symptom, you are not contagious for more than seven to 10 days. Actually, it's really nine days maximum, but most people say a week. So if you're PCR positive, three weeks later, you're not contagious. That's, a, that's an important implication of a test. The second part is dealing with sensitivity of the test. There's something called cycle thresholds. The number of averages necessary to amplify the material enough that you detect it. This sounds very technical and sort of boring and irrelevant, but it turns out the way that PCR testing is done is the test stops amplifying once you detect it. It turns out that in the UK, for instance, the NHS uses a PCR cycle threshold of 40 to 45, okay? The US FDA recommended using 40, uh, but we generally use 35 to 40. It's not reported often. Now remember those numbers, 40, 45. This is a graph of a study that was done recently, but this was reported back in August 2020 by the New York Times, the Bible of science. And the New York Times even noticed that at a cycle threshold of 35 or more, you're not detecting contagious virus, okay? In this study, it says that 2.7% of cultures were positive for live virus. That, that is necessary to be contagious. It's not a fragment of dead RNA in your throat that makes you contagious, it's actually live virus. So you're essentially not contagious if you're using a cycle threshold of 35 or more. Remember what I said, the NHS uses 40, and most labs in the United States use 35 to 40, still today. This was not just known to the uh, New York Times. Somebody named Anthony Fauci noted this in July 2020. He was quoted in an interview, at a cycle threshold of 35 or more, the chances of it being replication competent, meaning contagious, are minuscule. In his words, you gotta say it's dead nucleotides, period, if a cycle threshold of 35 or more is being used. This is never discussed in the task force except by me. What's the risk and for whom? The original WHO estimate was 3.4% infection fatality rate. The truth, it's on the order worldwide, although variable, depending on population, elderly age, all the risk factors that we know, of about 0.15. And if you're under 70, it's 0.05%. This has been widely documented in multiple studies. The number one risk factor for COVID dying is age. The mean age of death is about 80, all over the world, 80. 80% 80 of deaths occur in people over 65. 99.83% of deaths in the United States are in people over 25, and 99.97% of deaths are in people over 15. The age gradient of the risk to die is greater than a thousandfold different for people who are under 20 versus people who are old. And this is CDC data, by the way, I'm showing on that chart. For perspective, this was written about back in uh, last summer, the COVID age for median death in most countries is equal to or greater than the life expectancy. Germany, life expectancy 81, median age of death 82. Italy, 84, median age of death from COVID, 82. The UK, 81, median age of death from COVID, 85. And the US, uh, 79, life expectancy, median age of COVID death, 77. That's just perspective. 
not trivializing the people that die, but that's a reality. The bottom line is that COVID is not very dangerous for the overwhelming majority of people, and the risk of dying is far lower than initially thought. This is fact, it's not an opinion. The risk to and from children is of great concern. There's nothing more concerning to a parent than the risk to children. There should be nothing more concerning to a society than the risk to children. The risk to children, there's a lot of words on this slide. I just want to point out something here that uh, it's almost zero if you don't have a serious illness and you're a child. And what do I mean by a serious illness? I'm talking about leukemia, okay, immunocompromised diseases. I'm not talking about uh, you have mild hypertension like uh, people my age get, which, by the way, is not an independent risk factor, despite what you've heard. The CDC was quoted as saying, in this pandemic, the deaths of children are less than in each of the last five flu seasons. JAMA Pediatrics did a study of 46 North American hospitals and quoted the bottom line, our data indicate that children are at a far greater risk of critical illness from influenza than from COVID-19. In California, in the 2017-18 flu uh, pandemic, which is the last one that I could get the data on, 5.4% of people who died were children in California, 5.4%. In COVID in California, 0% of California deaths are in children, 0%. What about spread from children? The, the best study is a very sophisticated molecular tracing study, contact tracing study from Iceland. They did not find a single instance during their wave of COVID of a, of a child infecting a parent by molecular contact tracing. There are separate studies in more than a dozen countries throughout Europe, I've named them often on the news, uh, who showed no significant spread from children or from schools. The European Center for Disease Prevention study included 17 countries. Open schools were not associated with accelerating community transmission. And K-12 teachers, by the data, have the same case incidence as the community when schools are in session without masks or any other social distancing in children. Children have had an extremely low risk of serious illness from COVID and almost zero risk of death. Children have rarely spread the virus to adults, and there is no special risk whatsoever to children in K-12 schools. That's just fact.